chapter ten of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten all preliminaries happily arranged mr allen o'donagough and his suite set off for brighton emotions produced on the mind of miss martha by looking out of the window mr allen o'donagough appears in a new dress he makes a new and rather dangerous experiment but it answers if the result of mr allen o'donagough's experiment upon the memory of the billiard marker had been productive of satisfaction to himself its consequences were more gratifying still to his lady little as he had said about it his private intention had been to keep as much as possible out of the way of general hubert and all the brilliant set in which he presumed him to move till he should be prepared to meet him advantageously the first step towards this was the ascertaining that his own altered appearance was likely to prevent all danger of disagreeable reminiscences the second must of course consist in preparations for assuming such an appearance and manner of life as might justify the ambitious hope of being received as a relation to this he attached quite as much importance as his wife though he said much less about it and was determined to hazard more and run greater risks to obtain it than it ever entered in her head to hope for mr allen o'donagough had ever been a man of spirit and enterprise and having paid the penalty almost inevitable in his line upon indulging with too little caution in the display of his peculiar talents he now determined with ripened age and ripened wisdom to carry on business with that species of boldness and prudence united which is only to be found in the very highest class of his profession during many years of his residence in new south wales his purpose had been to make paris the theatre of his future experiments but he saw or fancied he saw in the remarkable accident which had brought him within reach of such persons as his wife claimed kindred with the possibility of a career infinitely more distinguished than he had ever before ventured to hope for there was considerable sagacity displayed in the reasoning by which he convinced himself that the very circumstances that seemed to render such hopes almost ridiculously audacious would in reality make their attainment easy had general hubert and the wealthy and distinguished persons with whom he was connected been less completely above all and everything with which mr allen o'donagough had mixed himself during his former life there might and must have been danger notwithstanding his changed appearance of such accidental allusions to past scenes as it might have been very difficult to get over but as it was nothing of the kind could be at all likely to occur and having once made up his mind to hazard as a necessary outlay a considerable portion of the money he had contrived to make he became almost as impatient to open the campaign as mrs o'donagough herself during the course of the following day much business was got through by inquiries made according to mrs o'donagough's suggestion in berkeley square it was ascertained that general hubert's family were at brighton by boldly parading through all the different haunts where formerly he was best known mr o'donagough found there was no danger whatever of his being recognized as the flash major allen once so conspicuous among them by the placing an english bank-note for twenty pounds in the hands of his wife with a declaration that it was to be wholly expended in the decoration of herself and her daughter he produced in the hearts of both a throb of pleasure which few things in this life can equal and laid the foundation of two wardrobes which were destined for years to be the admiration of many beholders and by placing himself in the hands of a first-rate german artist in st james street he was not only sure of coming forth from them as near in shape and air to the standard he desired to obtain as it was possible for mortal shears to make him but with as much safety as any precaution could ensure of not permitting his person to be studied by any operator who had ever enjoyed that advantage before in addition to all this the active o'donagough contrived before the day was half over to have himself and his appendages established in private lodgings in hatton garden where by the aid of a neighbouring ham-shop and a little lodging-house cookery they contrived to live for a week at very trifling expense but what a week of ecstasy it was and how fully was it demonstrated in the case of mrs o'donagough that mind is omnipotent over matter few people enjoyed nice things as she was wont to call them that is to say such eating as particularly suited her fancy with more keen relish than mrs o'donagough yet during this week of strongly excited sensibilities although nothing of an edible nature was set before her that she could upon reflection approve she scarcely uttered a murmur tough steaks and greasy cutlets appeared and were consumed almost without an observation 
while the soaring spirit enjoyed a banquet in the contemplation of caps bonnets gowns and mantles not yet perceptible to the eye perhaps but of which the intellectual faculties were fully cognizant which rendered all grosser gratifications contemptible i do enjoy my porter though uttered after the dismissal of a peculiarly unmanageable specimen of what is called animal food was almost the only symptom betrayed by mrs o'donagough of her being alive to anything of the kind at length industrious man had done his part and industrious woman also the things were all sent home and all that remained to be done before their places were taken for brighton was to pack them up as patty said so that they might all come out looking as lovely and beautiful as when they were put in and where are we to leave all the rubbish we have brought over donny while we make this delightful little trip inquired his lady mr o'donagough had hired a garret in the house for the purpose mr o'donagough had secured three outside places by the earliest coach mr o'donagough had with his own hands brought home a little basket in which their necessary refreshments during the following day were to be deposited in short mr o'donagough had forgotten nothing well now everything seems smooth before us said mrs o'donagough over their last hatton garden tea-table oh my darling agnes how i do long to get at her by the bye donny i do think it was rather silly of you never to let me mention to her the time of our coming over if i had they would be expecting us and i am not quite certain if i should not like that better than taking them by surprise we have discussed that matter already my dear replied her peaceable husband my notion was that it should be better to take them by surprise and i think so still well that's settled now so there's no good in talking any more about it but don't you think that if there were any of them to see patty and me scrambling down from the top of the coach they might think it did not look as we were really people of fashion as you have all along promised we should be said his wife mr allen o'donagough paused a little before he replied this was one of the points upon which his system of tactics dictated very strong regulations and though he was very sleepy and much more inclined to doze than to talk having secured himself from slipping off the horsehair bottomed chair by fixing his feet upon the mantelpiece he roused himself sufficiently to express what he thought the occasion called for as to that my dear and indeed as to all things of the same kind it is quite necessary that you and patty too should understand matters thoroughly at once i do mean that we should appear like people of fashion i am making immense sacrifices and running enormous risks for this purpose but it is altogether childish and silly to suppose that this can be done by people no richer than we are without a vast deal of very clever management the real secret is mrs o'donagough to keep all our contrivances out of sight and if you can find out the way to do that it don't signify a single straw what saving tricks you practise behind the scenes as to my driving about the country like your fine cousins and nieces and i don't know what all it is a perfect madness to dream of such a thing i give you my honour that i should be in jail before i was six months older but if we all carry on the war upon the same principle setting our wits to work one and all to save money when nobody is looking at us and to spend it in good style when they are we may go on making an excellent appearance and with no danger of getting into a scrape either do you understand what i mean patty oh dear yes papa i do indeed and i think it is a very good way i never do care how dirty or shabby my clothes are when i am out of sight so that i can be smart when i go out to be seen was the young lady's reply kiss me darling said the delighted father who was really becoming more fond of her every day that is exactly the principle on which we must all act and i hope mrs o d that you intend to be as reasonable about it as your daughter let me alone for that sort of thing o'donagough i don't believe that there is a woman in the world who would be more capable of sacrificing everything to the making a good appearance than i should i was always brought up from my earliest infancy to think a great deal of it my poor dear mother i am sure never thought of anything else and i should be sorry if my daughter did not come after me with the same right feelings all that is to be said therefore about this going outside is just that we must take care not to be seen or known that is quite right my dear and speaking like yourself this time of course there can be no danger as nobody that you ever saw in your life before would be likely to find you out on the top of the brighton coach 
however as a general rule it may be well to remember that on all such occasions the best and safest way is to make yourself look as little like what you are as possible so that instead of being rather better dressed than the rest of the company on the top of a coach people that understand the sort of thing that we have in view would take care to be the worst for just observe now supposing we sat opposite to some sharp-sighted body who having scoured us from hat to toe should make up his wise noddle to believe that we were tallow chandlers taking our daughter from the melting to get a puff of sea air well suppose that same person saw us afterwards in the very best and grandest society would he not be ten times less likely to know us in our fine traps than if we had worn something in the same shape and fashion when he met us on the coach that's very true my dear said mrs o'donagough and late as it is i think i shall take the hint and make some little alteration in what i was going to wear you understand the sort of thing patty that your papa means don't you my dear yes to be sure i do and you shall see if i can't make a good sight of myself replied miss patty starting away from the tea-table and seizing upon one of the bonnets that lay on the top of a trunk ready for the morrow she began to take out pins and demolish bows at a great rate my dear child what are you about cried her mother you ain't going to waste all that good ribbon i hope waste it how can you talk such nonsense mamma as if that was what papa wanted no i won't waste it but do just look here don't i look like a vulgar dowdy well to be sure fine feathers do make fine birds there is no denying it said mrs o'donagough looking with some mixture of vexation at martha's very successful attempt to make herself look like a vulgar dowdy capital girl cried her father chuckling she is up to everything at an early hour the next morning the active enterprising hopeful trio were making as much noise in their sitting-room as if a dozen ordinary persons were about to take their departure from it pray pray don't set that box up on end it has got both our best bonnets in it cried the elder lady oh my that's all the artificial flowers for mamma and me screamed the young one fiercely extricating a deal case from the hands of the maid who was irreverently jerking it out of the way make the tea can't you bawled mr o'donagough to his wife the branch coach will be here in a minute and i positively will not stir an inch till i have had my breakfast at length however they were snugly accommodated father mother daughter packages and all not only on the branch coach but on the very vehicle itself that was to convey them to the goal of their wishes but this was not effected without some difficulty mrs o'donagough was large and none of her adventures had hitherto accustomed her to such a degree of activity as was necessary to bring her to the place she was to occupy so that the assistance of a man putting the last touch to the luggage on the roof as well as that of mr o'donagough who was stationed below was required to aid the operation the young lady had skipped up with great agility the moment her father indicated to her the place where she was to sit and while her mamma was mounting she stood up clapping her hands and shouting with laughter as she watched the difficult process after this first impediment to their setting off had been overcome however nothing could be more prosperous or satisfactory than their journey the whole family each in their respective style ably sustained the incognito which had been enjoined mr o'donagough during the entire distance preserved total silence mrs o'donagough talked a good deal it being an exercise to which she was too much accustomed to leave it off without great inconvenience but she so cautiously avoided every allusion to her own dignity and so steadily abstained from addressing either of her companions by name that a young sussex farmer who was the person to whom she chiefly addressed herself would have been a very clever fellow indeed had her conversation left information of any kind upon his mind miss o'donagough as steadily kept in view the part she had to perform as either father or mother but this did not prevent her from looking pretty constantly in the face of the young farmer thinking however all the time how very much handsomer her dear jack was according to his usual system mr o'donagough while appearing to consult his wife on many points with the most amiable conjugal confidence had hitherto uttered nothing definitive respecting his projects on arriving at brighton and in this he acted wisely as before he could be said to know what he intended himself he had one or two little experiments to make and one or two questions to ask the first words he had been heard to utter since he placed himself beside his daughter on the top of the vehicle were spoken to that young lady as soon as herself and her ponderous mamma were once more safely lodged on the pavement and they ran thus as he eyed the waiter who came forth from the hotel at which the coach stopped 
i suppose the thing you would like best to do just at present would be to eat wouldn't it well done you for a good guess papa replied miss patty in high glee and you couldn't be more right if i had been a glass case and you had seen through me tis good news hearing that word isn't it mamma indeed it is patty replied mrs o'donagough i feel perfectly sinking and exhausted it is no joke travelling from london to brighton with nothing on earth to keep soul and body together but a miserable dry sandwich of salt ham come come let's have no grumbling cried mr o'donagough turning sharply round from the waiter to whom he had been giving his orders if you will follow this person upstairs he will show you into a sitting-room while i see after all your multitude of boxes grumbling muttered mrs o'donagough in reply i should like to know where the most grumbling comes from but perceiving her husband to be no longer within hearing she peaceably followed the waiter into the room to which he led them and only indulged herself by saying as he opened or shut the window drew the blinds up or drew them down or employed himself on some other of the numerous assiduities which denote the presence of a waiter let everything in the way of refreshment which the gentleman has ordered be of the very best that the place can furnish and let it all be brought with as little delay as possible that is i mean to say instantly why mamma cried miss patty who the instant the waiter had quitted the window flew to throw it open as widely as the sash would permit this place is more lovely ten times over than even london itself my what a sight of beautiful full-dressed gentlemen i do see crossing along at the bottom of the street and such bonnets i shall grow wild i can tell you that if i am kept in long either for eating or drinking or anything else why there's officers by dozens mamma oh my goodness what a delightful place her indulgent mother did not long delay to station her own ample person beside the juvenile form of her delighted daughter and so much was there within reach of their eager eyes as they fearlessly thrust forward their heads and shoulders to obtain a view of the point where the street opened upon the marine parade that hungry as they were the cold meat and porter arrived before they had more than once turned round their heads to look for them mr o'donagough entered in the wake of the tray and for some reason or other seemed in high good humour come along both of ye he exclaimed gaily the deuce is in it if you are not ready tis wonderful how quickly the sea air gets hold of one and then seating himself before a prodigious mass of cold beef he began to handle the cutlass-like weapon which was placed beside it with such skilful zeal that his fair companion seemed to forget for a while all earthly blessings save such as he heaped upon the plates before them and what do you think of brighton miss patty said he as distinctly as his occupation would allow it is a beautiful divine glory of a place papa replied patty and i am sure i shall like it a monstrous deal better than london it really does seem an enchanting spot donny said his wife setting down an empty beer-glass of majestic size and if things go on well here about the huberts and everything else you know i do hope and trust you will give us a decent lodging and let us enjoy ourselves i shall be able to tell you more about it my dear an hour hence replied mr allen o'donagough continuing to carve and to eat with a degree of celerity that not only showed his seaward appetite but proved his time to be precious as soon as you have done eating you must go into the room where i have had all the luggage stowed and let us see what's what a little you must unpack right away the trunk that has the things which came from the tailors for me and patty when you have done cramming i'll get you to look out my shaving tackle i shall want the key of the hat-box too come along both of ye there's good girls lor papa do stop a moment you never do care for tarts like mamma and me tisn't fair to take us away in the very midst of our treat said patty making however no unnecessary delay as she spoke you must stop a little if you please added his wife in like manner continuing her employment with all possible activity tis such abominable extravagance to pay for things and not eat them mr allen o'donagough listened to reason and continued to amuse himself with a crust of bread and cheese till the last tartlet disappeared when starting up he exclaimed now for it then i want to be stirring i promise you but to be sure you are not going to dress yourself in new clothes before you go out to look for lodgings mr o'donagough are you patty and i must go as we are i can tell you that said mrs o'donagough i declare i will do no such thing mamma cried the young lady bursting into open rebellion i would no more go out and meet all those beautiful officers in that horrid bonnet and shawl than i'd fly 
i would rather be whipped a great deal nonsense patty replied her mother it is much better to do that i can tell you than to begin the thing half and half you may be quite sure my dear that there is not one of them will know you again when they see you in your pink satin bonnet and your beautiful pink scarf don't trouble yourself to squabble any more about it for you are not to go out with me at present let your dress be what it may said the gentleman not go out with you o'donagough replied his wife with equal disappointment and surprise why you don't mean to take lodgings for us without ever letting me see them no my dear of course not for my eyes i'm not going to take lodgings mrs o'donagough but only just to take a look at the place and judge whether our taking lodgings here at all would be likely to answer or not mrs o'donagough understood her husband's voice and knew that he most certainly would go out alone so without further opposition she prepared to obey his behests and having done her part in finding the various articles he wanted left the room followed by her daughter without making any further observations on his mode of proceeding but though she made the chamber door in some degree slam after her the sitting-room window soon restored her good humour and she and her daughter continued to recreate themselves by gazing through it at all things within reach of their eyes wholly insensible to the progress of time how long they had remained thus pleasantly engaged they would have been at a loss to say when at length their attention was drawn from without by the opening of the door behind them they both turned their heads at the same moment and saw a gentleman enter the room whom at the first glance neither of them recognized yet nevertheless it was no other than mr o'donagough himself he was dressed very handsomely in a suit which though not exactly mourning and not exactly clerical might at the first glance have been mistaken for either but the circumstance which though seemingly trifling made the change in his general appearance the most remarkable was his having substituted a white muslin cravat without any shirt-collar being visible for his usual black stock above which was wont to rise two well-stiffened ears of dimensions considerably larger than common this and the metamorphosis his hair had undergone which when he left the room had been sable silvered but when he re-entered it it presented a wavy yet closely fitted outline of locks nearly flaxen made him look so totally unlike himself that when at length his wife and daughter became aware of his identity they both burst into violent laughter what on earth o'donagough have you been doing to yourself cried his wife as soon as she recovered the power of speaking you look fifty times more like a methodist parson than anything else your coat and all that is very new and very nice certainly but i can't say i approve the change at all what with your shaving and all the rest you have altogether lost the look of a man of fashion which i used to admire so much in you mr o'donagough looked steadily in his wife's face for half a moment and then said very gravely i am not so young as i have been my dear any more than yourself and i am inclined to think now that a respectable appearance is more to be desired than a dashing one the steady look was not removed for another half moment after he had finished speaking and when it was his wife had not only ceased to laugh but said in accents quite as demure as his own i am sure i am quite of the same opinion mr o'donagough when one is going to mix with families of distinction there is nothing so important as an air of dignity and-and of superior style and character and all that sort of thing you look very nice indeed mr o'donagough and i promise you i for one shall be exceedingly angry with patty if ever she gives a look or says a word or giggles and titters or gives any sign whatever of your appearing different from what you used to do you may depend upon it my dear patty knows a great deal better than to do anything half so vulgar and silly she certainly knows very little about most things as yet but she is not such a fool either as to laugh at her own father or try to make other people laugh at him on account of his dress or anything else if i am laughed at she will be quite sure that no very great notice will be taken of her you need not be afraid of me said patty turning again to the window papa knows how to take care of himself and what will go down best with the grandee cousins you talk so much about there's no doubt about that and so he don't take it into his head that i ought to look like an old quiz too i shall say nothing to nobody about him that's a first-rate girl mrs o d and if the fair play is given her i'll lay my life on it she will make her fortune said the well-satisfied father it is not the first time that has been said of her my dear replied his wife with a nod of the head that meant a great deal it is not a little that will content me for her i promise you but get along donny 
don't waste any more time talking i shall be dying to see you back again and know something about what's to become of us next mr o'donagough obeyed her but said nothing and his wife being rather tired of standing drew a chair to the window and seating herself beside the still unwearied patty beguiled the time by teaching her how to know colonels majors captains and lieutenants by their uniforms mr o'donagough meanwhile with a hat of rather larger dimensions than was at that time usual and a stout elderly-looking walking-stick sallied forth to perambulate the streets of brighton for the first time for rather more than fifteen years had he however been a greater stranger there still he might have taken less pains in preparing for this expedition but the time had been when few places knew him better and before he could conscientiously feel himself justified in indulging his wife of his bosom by once more taking up his quarters there he deemed it necessary to ascertain how lasting might be the impression he had left on the minds of the permanent inhabitants here too as in the familiar purlieus of leicester square there were haunts over the nature and destination of which time seemed to have no power where billiard-balls rolled in days of yore he found them rolling still the same sights and the same sounds greeted him in the self-same places and so little changed was the aspect of these minor features that till he looked more widely around him and perceived that unless brick and mortar had obeyed the commands of some enchanted lamp years must have indeed passed since he last stood there he could almost have fancied that he had pocketed his last brighton winnings but yesterday though very far in general from being the plaything of his own imagination mr allen o'donagough stood hesitating for a moment whether or not he should enter a certain doorway leading to what he remembered to have been the most approved rendezvous for gentlemen of his own class when brighton was one of his many homes it was not because he feared the keen eye of a marker when much less carefully equipped for such an encounter he had stood this test triumphantly despite even his pretty hazard but fifteen years before there dwelt in that dusky mansion a pair of the brightest eyes that had ever looked upon him the light young figure too and the gay ready smile of her to whom they belonged were as fresh in his memory as if he had left these also but yesterday he had made this reckless thoughtless thing believe he loved her and in return she had given but too certain proof that she loved him the house before which he stood had been her father's did she dwell there still and would she know him these were the questions which caused the middle-aged respectable-looking mr allen o'donagough to pause and hesitate before a door which he ought to have entered quickly or have passed with scorn he felt that he might be exposing himself needlessly to a great risk but yet the trial might be worth making for if successful he conceived it impossible he could ever be tormented by such doubts and fears again this consideration at length nerved him to the enterprise and he went in there was the same scent of ill-extinguished lamps as he advanced and as it seemed the identical much-worn oilcloth under his feet there was too within a glass enclosure at the foot of the staircase a gaily dressed female it was there exactly there that his bright-eyed susan used to sit it was there he had seen her for the first time and there little as she guessed it at the moment and little perhaps as he himself intended it should be so he had looked upon her the last he now stared at the stout gaudily decked woman before him and though feeling something perhaps a little akin to disappointment it was a relief to know that there was not any danger to be run from deep impressions on poor susan's memory they are playing upstairs as usual i suppose said he stopping before the open window frame at which sat the capacious barmaid the woman started and looked up but as soon as her eyes encountered the respectable figure of mr o'donagough she looked down again upon the page on which she was writing and quietly replied yes sir that glance however which had sufficed to deceive her had undeceived him they were susan's eyes and none either that had looked upon him and though girlish delicacy of every kind was sadly merged and lost in most coarse womanhood he felt perfectly sure of the identity is the room crowded ma'am he resumed willing again to see those beautiful eyes so altered yet the same again the woman started and before she answered drew aside a curtain that obscured the light of the window behind her when the last light of the setting sun fell full upon his face but this instead of producing danger most effectually saved him from it the susan of former days again looked steadily at him for a moment and then slightly smiling probably at the suspicion to which his voice had given birth she replied upon my word sir i don't know 
as if affronted by the abruptness of the reply he turned suddenly away and walked out she does not know me he murmured as he went and if she does not no one will there was perhaps one little grain of mortification mixed in the full bushel of satisfaction produced by this experiment but if so our adventurer was too wise a man to sift for it with an alert and active step he repaired to the more fashionable part of the gay town and within a little more than one hour of the time he had left them mr o'donagough returned to his family with the agreeable intelligence that he had seen some very handsome apartments on the marine parade and that they might take possession of them immediately if they approved of them End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven unexpected news making virtue from necessity a satisfactory correspondence preparation a morning visit dramatic effects a domestic-looking party consisting of a very lovely young woman and two children with another lady who might perhaps be their governess were seated upon one of the rare masses of stone which in default of better are at brighton called rocks when the occupation of each was suspended by the approach of a gentleman who had just descended a flight of steps leading down the cliff the lovely lady ceased to converse with the more homely one who sat beside her the youngest child suffered a whole frock-load of marine treasures to fall again amidst the shingles whence she had culled them while she darted forward to greet the intruder and the elder one who was too tall to be called a little girl and too slight and juvenile in appearance to be classed as a great one shut up the book she was reading and joyously exclaimed papa how very cool and comfortable you all look here said general hubert for he it was who drew near and how extremely skilful you have been in finding out the only coin of vantage that could produce sufficient shade to shelter you and it produces sufficient shade to shade you too montague said his wife making room for him between herself and her companion i am so glad you are come before the east india man is out of sight did you ever see a more stately creature how beautifully one half of her canvas catches the sunshine while the remainder is as dark as night from that little black canopy of a cloud that so mysteriously hovers over her this is certainly the most beautiful day for lights and shades that we have had yet oh my poor agnes said the general heaving a deep sigh but with so comic an expression of countenance as only to make his wife smile what means that tender sigh my dear said she looking at him with an evident expectation of hearing something that would amuse her but general hubert shook his head and replied in a voice at least half serious i am very much afraid dearest that i bring news which will vex you what do you mean hubert cried agnes a little impatiently it cannot be anything the matter about the boys or you would not look so half disposed to jest as you do probably not agnes no dearest i have heard nothing about the boys but and here he stopped turning his eyes at the same time upon the two little girls and then with a smile upon their governess this lady returning the smile rose instantly and stretching out a hand to either pupil said this is lazy work young ladies remember we have had no walk yet the children or at any rate the elder one looked a little inclined to linger and hear what papa was going to say but the habit of obedience seemed too strong to be broken and after one short questioning look that received no encouragement she accepted the offered hand and the trio set off together leaving mrs hubert waiting for the disclosure which her husband was evidently come on purpose to make with a curiosity that seemed to increase in exact proportion to its delay i do not like sending that dear excellent miss wilmot off so cavalierly said the general watching the retreating party nevertheless i am much obliged to her for understanding my look so readily for i should scarcely like to trust to your philosophy agnes the reception of the news i bring while elizabeth was here but nobody is here now my dear general she replied and i implore you to tell me instantly what this terrible news is the general put his hand into his waist-pocket and drew forth from it two visiting-cards and a three-cornered note agnes stretched forth her hand received them and read aloud mrs a o'donagough miss o'donagough eastcliff and again on the other card mr a o'donagough eastcliff montague are you jesting with me were the first words uttered by agnes after reading these most unexpected names no truly i am not agnes he replied 
i took these cards and the note you hold in your hand which was left with them from the hall table as i entered the house ten minutes ago and guessing whereabouts i should find you set off again instantly to impart the news they convey but do not look so really and truly frightened agnes aunt barnaby is aunt barnaby no longer agnes shook her head ah hubert you know better than that a rose by any other name my dear dear husband how will you be able to bear it you shall see agnes things are most delightfully changed with me dear love since the days you seem to remember so distinctly when the barnaby i will not deny it had power very considerably to shake my nerves but pray read your note i am a little curious i own to see how she introduces herself mrs hubert opened the note and read aloud as follows you will easily believe my beloved agnes that amidst all the delightful feelings produced by returning to my native country the hope of once more pressing you to my heart predominates gracious heaven what a moment it will be for me when i present to you my darling child and when i receive yours in my arms when may this be my dearest niece of course neither mr o'donagough or myself or our sweet girl have any engagements that would interfere for a moment with our ardent wish of seeing you and yours i shall wait with the greatest impatience till i hear from you and trust that you will fix no very distant hour my beloved agnes for our meeting mr o'donagough charges me to present his respectful compliments to general hubert and martha whose young eyes beam with affection whenever your names are mentioned murmurs gently in my ear send my kind love mamma to all my dear young cousins for some few lingering hours then adieu my dear sister's own daughter and believe me ever your devotedly attached aunt martha compton o'donagough having finished this epistle mrs hubert put it into the hands of her husband as if it were impossible that he could have fully received all its terrible meaning from her delivery of it as she did this the expression of her fair face was so deplorably tragical and so humbly deprecative that the general though somewhat chagrined himself at this unexpected announcement could not retain his gravity but laughed aloud and you make a jest of it montague she exclaimed is that laugh genuine or is it only feigned to prevent my perceiving how deeply annoyed you are not feigned upon my word and honour agnes nor do i believe that aunt betsy herself though generally grave enough upon the subject of mrs barnaby could refrain from joining me were she here to see your piteous countenance how can you be so foolish my dear wife how can the elder lady or her young daughter or her very reverend husband possess any real power over our happiness now send her word dear that you will call upon her at two o'clock to-morrow i will not let you go to-day for you look fit for nothing but a gallop over the downs come along agnes i'll have the horses out directly the gloom which had rested on her beautiful countenance was chased by a smile as bright and sudden in its influence as the sunbeams whose effects she had just been studying oh my dear husband how i do love you said she gaily taking his arm and moving towards the stairs in the cliff with a step that seemed in unison with the recovered lightness of her heart i hope you do not think my dismay at receiving this unexpected news arises from my own personal distaste to aunt barnaby's society i do assure you that were it not for the dread i feel lest you should be annoyed by her somewhat in the same style as i have witnessed formerly i should not feel the slightest displeasure at it perhaps even i might be almost able to persuade myself that i should like to see her her little girl i really do wish very much to see she must be within a few months of the same age as elizabeth and notwithstanding all my greatness hubert as your honoured wife i have no inclination to forget how nearly they are related no more have i sweet agnes and it was precisely for that reason i gave the look to miss wilmot which made her lead away the children i suspected that you would betray a little more wonder and a little less joy on first receiving the intelligence than might be easily forgotten this would have been unfair i should not particularly wish elizabeth to make mrs a o'donagough her model but i see no reason why a little girl of her own age who must have been brought up simply at least and without any great pretension in the remote shades of new south wales should not obtain such a share of her love and good graces as her near relationship gives her a right to expect so torment yourself no more agnes about my miseries on the subject i could feel well inclined to laugh at the vehemence of my own feelings in days of yore on the subject of this poor lady and do not i assure you anticipate the least danger of a relapse i often think montague she replied that you have some mystical mode of reading my heart 
it so perpetually happens that you do and say exactly the things i most wish even when circumstances would lead me to expect something different but shall i confess that i now feel perfectly ashamed of myself from the excess of vexation this three-cornered epistle caused me solely i believe from its expressions of familiar affection i was foolish enough to think hubert that you would not like your daughter to be claimed as a relative by this obscure young cousin why considering agnes how many superlatively fine relations you have done my daughter the honour of giving her nesbits and stephensons without end i really think it would be unreasonable to complain of her being claimed as kindred by one humble lassie who has neither learned her steps from a french opera dancer nor her singing from an italian opera singer i am by no means certain that our simple elizabeth may not like her best this conversation brought them to their own door on reaching which a servant was dispatched to the stables to order their horses and while they were waited for mrs hubert after a little further consultation with her husband wrote the following note my dear aunt accept my best congratulations upon your return to england after an absence of so many years and let me fix two o'clock to-morrow for repeating these congratulations in person i feel quite anxious to see my young cousin who must be if i mistake not about the same age as my eldest girl i hope they will be good friends and playfellows general hubert begs to join his request to mine that mr o'donagough yourself and martha would give us the pleasure of your company at dinner on thursday at six o'clock believe me my dear aunt your affectionate niece agnes hubert this note approved and dispatched mrs hubert with a lightened spirit mounted her beautiful mare and galloped for a couple of hours over the sussex downs with as much enjoyment as if aunt barnaby had not been in existence her note reached its destination safely and was received by the whole of the o'donagough family in council mr o'donagough though not exactly confessing that he remained at home on purpose contrived to be in the drawing-room when the servant of the house entered with it and martha who from the reiterated harangues of her mamma on the subject had conceived a very distinct idea that most of her pleasures and all her consequence depended on the manner in which the huberts received them no sooner saw a smart footman bearing a note in his hand ring at the bell then springing back from the station she constantly occupied at the window she exclaimed here it comes mamma such a footman all over silver lace i'll bet a dollar it is to ask us to come and drink tea with them be quiet martha don't scream so loud said mr o'donagough oh how my poor heart beats cried his wife forcibly compressing that part of her person wherein it was lodged dearest agnes she would have added but a feeling of doubt and caution checked her and compressing her lips and assuming an air of dignified composure she suddenly resolved to express no further affection for mrs general hubert till it was ascertained how she was likely to be welcomed in return the lively martha gave a prodigious jump the instant the drawing-room door opened and clutched the important note from the maid-servant's hand now who'll know the news first i wonder she cried triumphantly holding her prize above her head how dare you behave so martha said mrs o'donagough hastily rising and approaching her daughter in a manner that made it evident there would be a battle for the note if the young lady yielded it not unresistingly but the matter was immediately decided by the authoritative voice of mr o'donagough himself who with more anxiety than he intended should appear sat picking his teeth and pretending to read a newspaper no nonsense if you please miss patty give your mother the note instantly and instantly the note trembled beneath the agitated fingers of mrs o'donagough best congratulation anxious to see young cousin good friends general hubert dinner on thursday oh my dear agnes my darling darling niece she exclaimed falling back in her chair in a very violent emotion how i dote upon her was there ever anything so sweet o'donagough this demand was addressed to her husband in consequence of his having caught the note as it fell from her hands as she clasped them in ecstasy after the hasty perusal of it what a fool i have been she continued with something between a sob and a laugh to let all your nonsensical doubts bother me as they have done nobody of course but myself can possibly know what agnes and i have been to each other let me have the note again donny dear darling creature how touching how sweet her language is i am sure you will dote upon her o'donagough and remember my dear that all she is she owes to me 
i formed her mind and manners and i think when you know her better you will confess that she does me no discredit dear me papa cried the young lady how you do spell it and spell it isn't it my turn now mamma she's my cousin papa more than she is yours you know the lady is my niece patty and not my cousin replied her father passing his hand across the lower part of his face to conceal a smile arising probably from a greater variety of incongruous and amusing recollections than either of his companions could understand the note he added is a very agreeable note as far as it goes and i presume you have no engagement mrs o'donagough that will prevent our having the pleasure of dining with general hubert on thursday next i rather think not she answered in the same tone of comic gravity nor do i intend to be from home at two o'clock to-morrow mayn't i see the note mamma cried patty almost whimpering i do think it is the hardest thing that ever was you two keeping it all to yourselves and making your jokes about it and i standing by as if i was a baby all the time give her the note dear donny said mrs o'donagough i don't wonder that she is longing for it there miss read that and rejoice though you can't know yet one half a quarter of the difference it may make to you miss o'donagough received the precious paper from her father and depositing herself with a good deal of vehemence in the corner of a sofa for her temper had been chafed by the delay began to study it though not testifying equal ecstasy to her mother she perused the first few lines with a well-satisfied air and when she came to the phrase i feel quite anxious to see my young cousin she looked up with a smile and gave a sidelong nod with her head that seemed to say i count for something in the business at any rate but when again throwing her eyes upon the note she read the words i hope they will be good friends and playfellows her colour arose to crimson and mounted to her very eyes for a moment she swelled in silence and then recovering breath exclaimed your cousin or niece or whatever she is may be as great and as grand as she will but she is a born fool and i know i shall hate her hoity-toity miss patty pray what is the matter now inquired her mother with very sincere astonishment matter indeed i wonder ma'am that you can bear to have me treated in such a way what does she mean by saying that her girl and me may be playfellows a precious girl she must be too if she is as old as me for her mother to talk in that way as if she was an idiot or a baby it is no good for you to fluster yourself in that way patty about nothing at all replied mrs o'donagough there are very few english girls you must remember as tall and womanly as you at fourteen and another thing is i can tell you that it is not every mother that chooses to bring her daughter forward as i do most ladies indeed keep their girls back as much as possible what the old ladies are jealous of em i suppose replied patty with an expressive toss of the head nasty unnatural old beasts i tell you i know i shall hate this good-for-nothing old woman who tries to make believe that her daughter is a baby to make herself seem young it's downright horrid isn't it papa i tell you what patty replied her father laughing if all girls were like you the mothers would find it pretty hard work to keep em back i fancy however you had better not put yourself in a passion about nothing perhaps your grandee cousin is not so old as you are and her mother may have forgot all about your age i dare say elizabeth hubert is exactly five months younger than patty observed mrs o'donagough but it is like enough she may be but a peaking little girl agnes was but a poor thread of a thing when she married i don't care the spit of a straw what she is returned her daughter old or young little or big it's all one to me only i wouldn't advise em to set me to be her playfellow as she calls it i'll teach her queer plays if she does i can tell her this little puff of disagreeable excitement blown away a process greatly facilitated by mrs o'donagough's judiciously alluding to the dresses it would be necessary to prepare for thursday nothing could be more agreeable than the strain of prophecy into which the conversation fell all the sanguine hopes and expectations of the parents respecting the numerous advantages they contemplated from an intercourse so auspiciously begun were freely expressed before their child who fully proved by several intelligent remarks that she was as competent to understand the subject as either of them one observation alone was muttered with conjugal mystery by mrs o'donagough into the ear of her husband and it ran thus do you feel any misgivings donny about the sharp eyes of agnes 
to which he most satisfactorily replied by snapping his fingers with such vivacity as to produce a sound clear as a castanet while at the same time he returned the mutter by pronouncing the single word stuff though the toilette of the following morning did not as mrs o'donagough observed signify a cent in comparison of that to be worn at the dinner-party still it was not altogether neglected at about twenty minutes before two they all three met in the drawing-room with eyes that seemed to challenge the examination and judgment of each other the first expression of applause was elicited by the smooth precision of mr o'donagough's new wig the full value of which his wife seemed to feel at that moment for the first time it's quite perfect donny said she i never saw anything equal to it in all my life why your own mother i mean that you look very nice and respectable indeed and i like and approve it very much mr o'donagough which name with the emphasis she gave it as fully explained to her husband all that was passing in her mind as if she had discoursed upon it for an hour he gave her a nod to show that she was understood and then a second nod to himself as he looked in the glass and felt conscious how perfectly well he deserved her approbation both expressed and implied the appearance of patty was the next object of attention and on this subject mr o'donagough was eloquent cordially returning the admiration he had received i hope you are contented with the looks of your girl mrs o d said he there is no denying ladies that you know how to spend your money what is this beautiful-looking stuff that her gown is made of is it satin no my dear replied his wife it certainly is not satin twenty pounds between us though a very pretty present would not give us morning gowns made of satin but it is a very beautiful manufacture donny which i like exceedingly it takes the colour so bright it is nothing in the world but cotton with just a few threads of silk you see run up and down to catch the eye but if it was the richest satin ever made the colour could not be more beautifully brilliant darling she looks like a full-blown jonquil doesn't she my dear she looks like an uncommon fine girl replied mr o'donagough her eyes are like stars i never saw them look so bright before and her fine long dark curls are as handsome as your own used to be my dear when i first met you at blank the first time i saw you i mean you are quite right my love excepting that her hair curls naturally it is exactly like mine and i must say she does look very handsome to-day egad resumed the father i don't know what you have done to her her complexion looks so beautiful to be sure you have not and here he imitated with his hand applied to his face the delicate action employed to rouge a lady's cheek you must not do that my dear it is all very well and very becoming at about twice her age but she don't want it yet mrs o'donagough said nothing in reply but employed herself in settling the collar of her own embroidery that finished the dress of her daughter while patty turned aside her head and laughed but you say nothing about me my dear said the mother after having completed the pinchings and smoothings of patty's dress tell me how you like my cap and my gown and my fichu and my cuffs and my bag in short tell me honestly donny what do you think of me all over lor mamma what an odd question cried her lively daughter laughing and turning round to assist in the scrutiny i'll defy him to say that you ain't very nicely dressed though perhaps as to all over he may say that you look monstrous big i'll tell you what miss patty you will be half as big again before you are as old as me take my word for it replied mrs o'donagough a little chafed at the remark however she added with more complacency i am not so big as the duchess that we met this morning on the pier and i see so many large women here all in their own carriages that i am perfectly contented to be fat i am quite sure it is the fashion i am quite sure of it too my dear replied her husband besides he gallantly added when ladies are as of fine height and as nobly built as you are they can carry off a great deal of fat without being at all the worse for it at this moment the bell of the house-door was heard to ring mrs o'donagough put her hand to her heart oh good gracious here they are come and stand by me patty that i may present you to her directly i hope she has not got her husband with her donny i dread the sight of that man hold your tongue don't be such a fool they are on the stairs he was right they were on the stairs they were at the door and the next moment they were in the room 
neither mr nor mrs o'donagough would have known agnes had they met her by chance her appearance was indeed most strikingly changed yet though in a different style she was perhaps more lovely than they had ever before seen her she had gained at least an inch in height after her marriage and the slight girl was now filled out and rounded into the perfect symmetry of womanhood what a delicate creature was the exclamation she had often drawn forth as agnes willoughby and what an elegant creature was the phrase which invariably followed her now the exquisite features too though still the same in outline were changed and even improved as to their general contour and the expressive eyes which formerly seemed to covet the shelter of their own fringed lids and to speak as it were but in whispers of the treasure of intellect within now appearing to gather courage from looking on the husband who was rarely long together absent from her showed in every glance a sort of ingenuous confidence of mind by which a physiognomist might read the purity simplicity and strength of her character in her hand she led a slight young thing as thin as a greyhound who though tall for thirteen and a half nevertheless looked perhaps younger than she was her silken brown hair hung low in clusters of thick curls round her neck and her peculiarly simple white dress with its plain pelerine and the seaworthy leghorn bonnet tied closely with a ribbon of its own colour under her chin gave her decidedly the air of a child behind them followed general hubert who showed that a fine person a noble expression of countenance a military carriage and graceful address may altogether constitute a very handsome man even though the lofty forehead be bald and the thin curls that are left sprinkled with silver notwithstanding the entire absence of every species of affectation or pretension which so remarkably distinguished the manners of mrs hubert there was something in her general air and appearance which effectually checked all approaches to familiarity in those who were not privileged to use it and to say the truth it would have been difficult to find any gentleman and lady whose appearance would have placed mr allen o'donagough less at his ease than those who now entered his apartment he bowed low as he stood behind his wife but with a movement that caused him to retreat rather than advance patty however fearlessly opened her large eyes upon the strangers and having no european scale of classification in her head felt little daunted by encountering an aspect and demeanour altogether new to her so entirely indeed did she possess her soul as they walked up the room as mentally to ejaculate well if that lanky thing is my fine cousin i shan't mind her a bit she won't put my nose out anyhow what a bonnet my but it was not to speculations such as occupied the minds of either her husband or her child that mrs o'donagough gave way it was as she would have expressed it the heart that spoke and not the judgment when she rushed forward and opening her expansive arms enclosed within them the graceful yet embarrassed mrs hubert so long indeed did she hold her there that the bystanders felt embarrassed too not well knowing what to do with their eyes or how to perform their own parts in a scene of such deep interest at length however the elder lady released the younger one from her strict embrace and then retiring a step stood gazing at her with clasped hands and head advanced as nearly as possible like a devotee offering adoration before a favourite shrine is it possible exclaimed mrs o'donagough do i indeed behold my sister's child a very well-looking pocket-handkerchief with its laced corner protruding as if instinct with sympathy from her bag was here drawn forth and did its duty well oh my dearest agnes i can hardly believe my eyes so lovely still and yet so greatly altered oh how my heart has longed for this dear moment but i must not be thus selfish thus absorbed mr o'donagough let me present you to my dear niece general hubert forgive me if at first i could see nothing but your charming wife i hope i see you well permit me to present my husband to you mr o'donagough general hubert general hubert mr o'donagough and this is your child agnes dear creature how excessively like the general and then whether tempted by the resemblance or by the fond feelings of a great-aunt she very nearly caught the young lady from the ground and pressed her so closely to her bosom as to produce an involuntary oh from the lips of the nearly spoilt child this over mrs o'donagough next turned to her own daughter though the last not the least important of her evolutions and taking her red young hand placed it in the delicately gloved palm of mrs hubert that lady as in duty bound kissed her cousin but her long ringlets and her fine colour 
her large bright eyes and her magnificent gown altogether brought aunt betsy and all her peculiar notions to her mind so forcibly that she almost trembled as she remembered that this most dear relation was expected to pay them a visit at brighton almost immediately but mercy on me how i let you stand cried mrs o'donagough perfectly satisfied that the earnest look given both by the general and his lady to her daughter proceeded from admiring astonishment let us sit down dearest agnes and marshalling her and her daughter who still held tightly by her hand to the sofa placed herself on a chair before it while the general bowed into an arm-chair beside it by mr o'donagough found himself under the necessity of making conversation that might suit the habits and prejudices of his host concerning whose strict conformity to the methodist persuasion he felt not the least doubt you have been long absent from this country sir said the general a slight twitching might have been perceptible about the mouth of mr allen o'donagough as he listened to this question but he instantly recovered himself and replied it has indeed been a long absence general hubert without either snuffing lisping or in any other obvious and ordinary manner altering his voice there was something in mr allen o'donagough's manner of saying these few words that made his wife notwithstanding her earnest attention to what her darling agnes was saying look up at him with surprise but she was a quick-witted intelligent woman and half a moment's consideration enabled her to recollect why it was he spoke now as she had never heard him speak before it was less than half a smile that passed over her face as cause and effect thus became perceptible to her but this half smile spoke a whole world of conjugal admiration mrs o'donagough now obtained sufficient mastery over the first burst of her emotions to look at the daughter of agnes with some attention from her youth upwards she had studied beauty both male and female too sedulously not to perceive under the closed straw bonnet a promise at least of good regular features and something more than a promise of remarkably fine eyes nevertheless on the whole the examination awakened no maternal jealousy she could not for a moment entertain a doubt as to which was the handsomest her daughter or her great-niece there sat her charming patty all glow all brightness in the very perfection of that undeniable beauté de diable which rarely indeed fails to illuminate the features of a womanly girl of fourteen while beside her sat elizabeth hubert pale and by no means particularly fair and with a countenance unawakened to all the thousand little conscious agaceries which are sure to play and sparkle about such eyes and lips as those of martha o'donagough moreover she looked such a mere child that any comparison between them seemed quite preposterous what a poor little weasel of a girl thought the well-pleased mrs o'donagough as she looked at her and her mother reckoned such a prodigious beauty too well to be sure it is impossible not to feel something like triumph at the difference such were her thoughts but all she uttered of them was is this dear child your eldest girl my dearest agnes yes replied mrs hubert she is my eldest girl but we have two boys older oh yes i remember and this dear creature then is your elizabeth for whom you told me general hubert's aunt lady elizabeth norris and your own great-aunt mrs elizabeth compton stood godmothers yes this is elizabeth is she in good health my dearest agnes perfectly so she is so very pale and thin isn't she nothing can be thinner certainly but we do not reckon her particularly pale none of our children are fresh-coloured but they have all excellent health then my dear love you must be contented with that which after all is the first of blessings and of infinitely more real importance than all the beauty in the world but to be sure she is the youngest-looking creature of her age that i ever saw who would believe agnes that there was not more than five months difference in age between your girl and mine no one certainly replied mrs hubert with a smile is it possible said general hubert who found it rather difficult to keep up a conversation with his sanctified-looking host is it possible that miss o'donagough is not more than five months older than elizabeth that is all general i assure you replied mrs o'donagough but the air of sydney you know is counted the finest in the world and i think that it is likely to have a great deal to do with the improvement of children but your dear girl is not very short neither only she looks so little and childish like compared to patty however that is a fault that will mend every day won't it dear 
elizabeth on being thus addressed smiled though without speaking and the beauty of that sweet smile perfectly startled the critical mrs o'donagough dear me she exclaimed with very blunt sincerity how pretty she is when she smiles oh dear that is so like poor sophy is she indeed like my mother aunt said mrs hubert with some emotion the smile is exactly like her replied mrs o'donagough and your mother was very slight too but nothing like so little as elizabeth at her age we never reckoned elizabeth so very little said the general laughing but rather the contrary do let the young ladies stand up together i know that is a very regular and orthodox ceremony which always ought to be performed when cousins meet for the first time and moreover i doubt if the english lass be not the taller of the two stand up martha said mr allen o'donagough with much solemnity the young lady obeyed but there was a little toss of the head and a little curl of the lip that spoke involuntarily perhaps the scorn which the idea of any sort of measurement between herself and her cousin created come elizabeth cried the general elizabeth stood up and yielded herself smiling and blushing to the hands of her father who having himself untied her bonnet and laid it aside placed her back to back with her cousin mrs o'donagough looked at her again as she thus stood with her head uncovered and something very nearly approaching to a frown contracted her brow she said not a word more about her departed sister or the beauty of her smiles but after a disagreeable sort of struggle with her own judgment she inwardly ejaculated if that girl was my daughter i should make something of her the military eye of general hubert had not deceived him there was but little difference in the height of the young ladies but that little was decidedly in favour of miss hubert you see i am right ladies said he i have been used to measuring recruits by my eye am i shortest mamma said patty in a tone that expressed both vexation and incredulity why yes you are my dear replied her mother i am sure i don't know how it can be you look so very much bigger and older oh what a maypole i must be said the still blushing elizabeth replacing her bonnet and thereby eclipsing one of certainly the least ordinary faces that ever was looked upon the rounded contour of the oval indeed that might be hoped for hereafter was not yet there and excepting when excited the delicate cheek was pale but the forehead eyes nose and beyond all else the finely cut full lips with that rare grecian wavy line which gives a power of expression possessed by few were all pre-eminently handsome and had it not been for the conviction that her niece agnes never did nor never would know how to make the most of beauty the last state of mrs o'donagough's mind respecting the parallel inevitably drawn between their two daughters would have been considerably worse than the first as it was however when elizabeth again sat down with her clothes bonnet and her quiet look of perfect childishness while martha after a momentary arrangement of her curls before the glass turned round upon her with a throat as white as ivory cheeks like a cabbage rose and eyes that darted liquid beams of youthful sauciness with all the airs and graces of conscious beauty it was utterly impossible she should feel otherwise than well contented with her the visit lasted about twenty minutes longer which to say the truth seemed quite long enough to all parties yet when mrs hubert rose to take leave her fond aunt was almost clamorous that she should stay a little longer oh dearest agnes must i lose you already think what a time it is since last we met it is such a treat to see you etc etc we shall have the pleasure of seeing you to-morrow aunt replied agnes kindly and of course my cousin will come with you unless indeed she would like to come earlier she added recollecting herself and share elizabeth's two o'clock dinner perhaps this would be the best way as it would enable them to take a walk by the sea together afterwards the operations of thought are proverbially rapid with us all but mrs o'donagough was a particularly quick person and even before her niece had ceased to speak the pros and cons for this nursery sort of invitation to martha had passed through her mind but notwithstanding all this quickness it was really not a very easy matter to decide she was perfectly aware that it would make her daughter what the young lady herself called as mad as fire but on the other hand it would probably lead to much greater intimacy against it was the obvious fact that the beautiful dress projected and already prepared for the occasion could not possibly be worn but then all the people in brighton would have an opportunity of seeing the young people together on the beach exactly as if they were one family 
in this dilemma mrs o'donagough wisely took the course which could most easily admit of retreat and with a countenance beaming with affection and pleasure replied there is nothing in the world she would like so well my dear agnes at what time shall she be with you a little before two if you please and then the final adieus were exchanged and the visitors departed End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve judgments formed and sentiments generated an animated discussion followed by a reasonable result some folks wiser in their generation than other folks the cousins a delightful day and its conclusion the o'donagough family remained perfectly silent till the door of the house was distinctly heard to close after their departing guests and even then mr o'donagough who had stepped to the window and so placed his eyes as to obtain a sidelong glance after them continued to hold his finger to his nose in token that no word was to be spoken till they had passed beyond the possibility of hearing it perhaps this extreme caution arose from a sort of prophetic consciousness on the part of mr o'donagough that when his daughter did speak it was likely to be with considerable energy nor if this were the case did he at all miscalculate no sooner did his finger quit his nose and his eyes direct themselves into the room instead of out of it than his wife and daughter both quote, cried havoc and let slip the dogs of war and quote. in plain prose they both burst forth into the most vehement and unsparing abuse of miss hubert's dress manner and general appearance isn't it a most extraordinary and unaccountable thing exclaimed mrs o'donagough that such a really elegant-looking woman as my niece agnes should choose to let her daughter go such a fright did any one ever see such an object it is a perfect mystery to me and that is the truth and pray how is she to help it replied patty her mother did not make her i suppose if she did not make her she made her bonnet rejoined her mother or at any rate she made her put it on and i am sure that if it had been an old extinguisher it could not have answered better for turning her into an object and a fright lor mamma what does the bonnet signify it only looks as if they hadn't a penny in the world but you won't pretend to tell me that if that lanky monster of a girl was to have as beautiful a bonnet as my pink one on it would make her look like anything else but what she is and that's as ugly as sin and you know it well patty said her father and if she is it's all the better for you my dear so i don't see why you should look so put out about it if what your mother says is to come true and you are to be taken to court and everywhere along with her it is a great deal better that you should outdo her than that she should outdo you these judicious remarks considerably softened the aspect of miss o'donagough she no longer looked like a hedgehog in attitude of declared hostility to all comers nay she almost smiled as she replied laura mercy papa you don't think i'm going to cry because my cousin isn't a beauty do you i am sure i can't say what may happen about the taking patty to court mr o'donagough observed mrs o'donagough with rather an anxious look that you know must depend altogether on the degree of intimacy that grows between us and of course it will depend in a very great measure upon patty herself oh my gracious cried the young lady i am sure i shan't do anything to get intimate with that scaramouche of a girl so you need not reckon upon it mind that i'd see the queen and the king too if there was one and all the princes and princesses upon the face of the earth at the bottom of the red sea before i'd demean myself to lick the feet of such a nasty vulgar ugly beast of a girl as that now patty i think you go rather too far said her father not that i want you to lick anybody's feet that's not the best way to get on in the world but though your cousin is not to be compared with you as a fine handsome bouncing girl of her age i don't think she is too ugly to speak to either do you know i should not wonder if some people were to think her quite pretty the quills rose again in the eyes and on the lips of the susceptible patty how can you stand there talking such nonsense papa said she sharply as if i cared whether she was pretty or ugly but when mamma talks of our getting intimate with her or of our ever being such friends as betty sheepshanks and i was it is altogether provoking and i would advise you both to give up the notion at once for it never will and it never shall be nasty stiff 
great baby i tell you what patty said mrs o'donagough stoutly though secretly trembling at the reception her unpalatable invitation to the nursery dinner was likely to receive i tell you what miss if you choose to set up your back at my relations in this way i'll never try to make one of them take notice of you and i should like to see where you would be then and what good all the nice clothes i have been getting together would prove without a single soul to look at them don't keep knitting your brows that way patty you don't look much handsomer than your cousin now i can tell you i only wish you could see yourself well ma'am i can see myself easy enough if that's all replied miss patty turning to the looking-glass arranging her hair and then flashing round again upon her admiring mother i am not at all ashamed to look at my own face it would be rather odd if you were patty i won't deny that said mrs o'donagough smiling with a look of very undisguised admiration but that's neither here nor there my dear we won't talk of your beauty before your face because that's very bad manners and into the bargain it is a great deal more to the purpose to determine what it will be the best to do about the time of your going to-morrow my dear my niece agnes who i must say seems inclined to do everything in her power to make you and elizabeth as intimate as possible has desired as the greatest favour in the world that you should spend the whole day with her that is to say go quite early patty and not ceremoniously like your papa and me you know at six o'clock but between one and two that you may take a long chatty ramble with her by the seaside after an early dinner i hope you will like that my dear i am sure it is paying you a monstrous compliment like it replied patty raising her voice to a very shrill tone i like playing at being a baby all day long with that stupid oaf of a girl i can't and i won't and that's flat nonsense patty said mr o'donagough that's not the way to get on i promise you i won't have you quarrel with your bread and butter in that style go to be sure you will and be thankful too if you know what's what and pray what am i to do with my beautiful striped gauze dress and my blue satin shoes am i to walk out with miss gawky in that fashion no my dear that is quite impossible no you cannot go full dressed as we intended that is entirely out of the question for this time said her mother you must just wear your new mousseline de laine patty it is an elegant thing and yet quite good style for a morning and your pink bonnet you know and the scarf so that you will be perfectly first-rate in appearance and enjoy besides the enormous advantage of letting everybody in brighton see that you are considered as one of the hubert family i wish with all my soul cried patty that every one of the hubert family had been packed off for botany bay the day we left it i see as plain as daylight that you and papa both mean to lead me to the life of a dog about em you will make me run away if you do i'll tell you that for i know i can't bear it don't put yourself in such a fuss patty for heaven's sake said her mother but more coaxingly than scoldingly for she still stood in very considerable dread of a final and positive refusal think my dear girl before you say so of the beautiful fine parties and the bows and the dances you'll be sure to come in for in berkeley square if you do but play your cards well now think of all this patty and do your very best to get thick with elizabeth hubert patty your mother's right this time said mr o'donagough so go at the time fixed and say no more about it i'll take you into a box at the playhouse the night after if you'll be a good girl miss o'donagough had a phrase which will explain these words produced upon her namely when papa's in earnest he is in earnest the promised play too undoubtedly helped her decision and altogether she was induced after distorting her much admired beauty by more than one grimace to reply well if i must i must but it is as bad as being whipped i can tell you that the subject was then judiciously permitted to drop and the far future of next winter in london with all the joys it might bring took its place effectually arming the mind of patty for the endurance of whatever present annoyance might arise which acting like catholic penances should lead to such a paradise meanwhile general hubert his lady and daughter pursued their way homeward it was probably not altogether from lack of a subject that they walked on so silently but instead of words mrs hubert only pressed her husband's arm to which he replied by somewhat of a more caressing pressure in return and the quietly smiling pronunciation of the word well neither did their daughter say much continuing to hold her mother's hand in silence till the door-bell of their own mansion had been rung 
and then smiling a little and colouring a good deal she said is not my cousin older than i am mamma she looks a vast deal older certainly was the reply do you think she will like to play at looking for shells among the shingles with emily and me perhaps not my dear you must endeavour to entertain her by rational conversation said mrs hubert entering the house and not sorry perhaps to interrupt the discussion by desiring her daughter immediately to get ready for the dinner which was waiting for her it was tete-a-tete therefore that general hubert and his wife entered the drawing-room and there was something whimsical enough in the manner in which their eyes encountered after silently seating themselves in two arm-chairs which faced each other agnes pursed up her beautiful mouth and endeavoured to look grave but the moment her eyes met those of her husband they both laughed this movement of the muscles however was quite involuntary on the part of the lady and speedily mastering it she said pray don't general hubert pray don't laugh at it what can we do i cannot choose but laugh agnes replied her husband if you look so comically dismayed and after all my dear i cannot say that we have seen anything that ought greatly to surprise us your aunt barnaby is as little altered as it is possible she could be in the time i think of mr o'donagough i have no remembrance but he appears to me quite as well looking and respectable a personage as we could reasonably hope for rather evangelical i suspect but under the circumstances i see no reason to object to this and as for their daughter i cannot but think that she is as precisely what mrs barnaby's daughter might be expected to be as it is possible to imagine wherefore dear wife look not so despondingly but thank the gods that matters are no worse all this was said lightly and gaily but mrs hubert seemed to have lost all inclination to laugh i would not be ungrateful to the gods montague said she but i must own i feel the arrival of the o'donagoughs to be a very great misfortune no no not so returned her husband not a very great misfortune agnes you must not class it so aunt betsy will be a little outrageous perhaps but we must contrive to soothe her and for the rest be quite sure that a little good management to prevent our meeting often and a little quiet patient civility when we do meet will suffice to prevent any very serious annoyance but our girl hubert you take the thing so admirably en philosophe that i will cease to torment myself about you but is it not grievous that elizabeth should find a cousin more bright and blooming than herself we must bear this agnes said the general but this is all miss o'donagough will do elizabeth no harm you may depend upon it soothed if not satisfied mrs hubert indulged in no more repinings for the present and feeling something like self-reproach at having experienced so much more vehement a distaste for her relations than her noble husband appeared to do she determined as far as possible to conquer or at any rate to conceal it to elizabeth she said little more on the subject but to miss wilmot the daughter of her own early friend and instructress she ventured to speak with entire freedom the peculiarities of her aunt barnaby were already perfectly well known to this lady and therefore without scruple of any kind she ventured to confess to her that although she wished every possible attention and kindness to be shown to miss o'donagough she did not wish the intercourse between the young ladies to grow into intimacy elizabeth is so childish miss wilmot continued mrs hubert that though i do not greatly fear her catching the singular manners of this poor girl i think she may not be capable of of disliking them i believe is the only honest word as much as i wish her to do not having yet seen the young lady replied miss wilmot smiling i can give no opinion upon this but if miss o'donagough be like what mrs compton describes her mother to have been elizabeth will not like her too well very punctually at two o'clock mr o'donagough himself conducted his young daughter to the door of general hubert and there took leave of her till the evening his parting words being now patty mind your p's and q's i know your mother often plagues you with a monstrous deal of preaching about one thing and another and you know i never scold you for laughing at it but she's right this time about making the very best of yourself with those stiff disagreeable people mind that patty don't you trouble yourself about my turning em all to good account if anything's to be got out of em replied the young lady with an expressive wink of the left eye and if i mind my hits that way i expect you'll let me hate em as much as i please that is fair isn't it the house-door opened as she finished a sentence and her father departed replying to it only by an acquiescent nod miss o'donagough was immediately ushered into the back parlour where the table was already spread for dinner 
and her two cousins seated on either side of their governess who was reading to them miss edgeworth's tale of the prussian vase all three rose to receive her the little emily as well as miss wilmot was properly introduced by elizabeth and the necessary quantity of handshaking performed while miss wilmot laying aside the splendid pink bonnet and scarf of the gaily dressed visitor smiled furtively aside as she remembered mrs hubert's anxiety lest her pupil should be incapable of judging fitly of the peculiar graces she displayed there was however in elizabeth's behaviour to her cousin no symptom of her having as yet formed any judgment of her at all for her manner spoke only the most perfect good-humour and civility a little blended with embarrassment do you like the sea cousin martha was the first attempt at the rational conversation her mother had recommended what sailing upon it rejoined miss martha no i meant walking near it and looking at it replied elizabeth but i should like you to tell me all about sailing too you have sailed a great way have you not and i have never been on the sea at all except between dover and calais and even that you know is not sailing did you like your voyage like it yes to be sure i did it's monstrous good fun i think i should like it too said elizabeth i never see any large ship passing up and down the channel without wishing to be aboard her i don't know about your liking it replied miss martha i think you seem too young to take such pleasure in it as i did and besides i don't believe there's no fun i mean on board ship at least i should think so unless people are nearly grown up i don't think children would be taken so much notice of do you think so said elizabeth innocently i should fancy children might be very well amused don't you think emily that you should like to run up and down the deck of a great large ship yes i should said the little one stoutly and i should not care if anybody noticed me or not i suppose not indeed you little thing said martha laughing did the sea disagree with you at all miss o'donagough inquired miss wilmot oh lor yes i was as sick as a cat for the first week replied the young lady you never saw anything like it in your life no sooner did i swallow anything you understand with an appropriate grimace but i had a good friend on board who took capital care of me and always showed me which side of the ship to walk and helped me up and down and all that sort of thing you know and so by degrees it went off and then i was as jolly as a tinker and such an appetite oh my how i did eat and then we got to famous fun with ship billiards and all the rest of the time till we got to sheerness i liked it better than anything else in the whole world and after sheerness i suppose you felt impatient to get to land said elizabeth yes i did succinctly replied miss o'donagough i do not wonder at that i think you must have been so impatient to see england oh no not i i did not care a straw about england just then but we lost one of our best friends at sheerness and that spoilt everything had you many passengers on board i am sure i hardly know anything about em they were all nasty people all nasty people exclaimed little emily yes little one all nasty people replied martha laughing i suppose she thinks i mean all dirty people what a funny little soul when you are as old as me miss emmy you'll know what ladies mean when they call people nasty we don't mean dirty clothes nor dirty faces neither but just everybody we don't like if you don't like me will you say i am nasty demanded the little girl looking at her rather reproachfully to be sure i shall but i won't dislike you if you'll give me a kiss for i think you are very pretty but if i was not very pretty should you call me nasty persisted the child yes i dare say i should for i hate everybody that is not pretty replied martha at the same time making one of her father's peculiar grimaces in such a manner as to indicate that miss wilmot was in her thoughts without making any reply respecting the offered salute the little emily turned towards the governess and after leaning against her knee for a minute or two took an opportunity when she bent her head of putting her arms round her neck and giving her a kiss well now if she isn't kept in good order i'll wonder said martha chuckling she knows what a whipping is or i'm much mistaken this was addressed in rather a low confidential voice to elizabeth but before she could reply to it the door opened and the dinner entered that's no bad sight early as it is for dining i am as hungry as a horse miss elizabeth where am i to sit 
what here next to the old lady let me sit at the bottom and carve shall i you shall see if i don't do it fit to be a married woman la what a nice dinner what a pity it is we have got no bows no opposition being made to miss o'donagough's placing herself at the bottom of the table she sat down and began vigorously to attack a leg of lamb intended as the piece de resistance of the entertainment will you not take some fish miss o'donagough demanded miss wilmot yes if there is butter and sauce with it replied martha but some of you must have mutton cause i've cut this piece off here little one you shall have it emily looked into the face of her governess but said nothing send it to me my dear if you please said miss wilmot but do not cut any more yet the young ladies both take fish the dinner sauce and all being greatly to miss o'donagough's satisfaction her spirits rose as it proceeded and she went on in a sort of crescendo movement eating and talking till she had got into the highest possible good humour well after all i think we shall be monstrous good friends elizabeth said she putting a third glass of custard into her plate and i don't know but what it may be better fun dining in this way and eating as much as i like than if i had come in my gauze frock and sat up doing grand with the old fograms in the dining-room i do hate old people like poison don't you to this appeal elizabeth answered nothing but almost involuntarily gave such a look to her governess as friends are apt to exchange when something striking occurs upon which for the moment they can make no other commentary martha saw this look and interpreting it in her own way shook her curls gave a slight laugh and said no more persuaded that her cousin had intended to caution her against being too open-hearted in the presence of that first and foremost of the fograms her governess but although this persuasion silenced her for the moment it rather added to her good humour and on setting out for the promised walk by the seaside she took the arm of miss hubert with very cousinly familiarity and drew her forward with a rapid step in the hope of outwalking the governess and emily and thereby ensuring a little fun and a great deal of confidential communication miss wilmot who knew her pupil well and feared not any injury to her from the association beyond its present annoyance made no effort to overtake them and contented herself by answering as sedately and discreetly as she could the speculations of the little emily on their guest which partook largely of that peculiar vein of observation in which children sometimes remark on what appears ridiculous to them with a freshness and keenness of quizzing that might be sought for in vain in the sallies of the most practised proficients in the art on reaching the steps in the cliff miss o'donagough had the extreme delight of perceiving that two gay-looking youths in regimentals had just descended them and were walking slowly onward the way they were about to go make haste elizabeth ain't we lucky she exclaimed on perceiving them and setting the example of the speed she recommended she placed her hand on the rail and ran down with extraordinary rapidity to the bottom of the flight though the light movements of her young companion hardly permitted her being very slow martha chid her delay and ere she had fairly reached the last step seized on her arm and by a vigorous pull obliged her to clear it by a jump what a slow fool you are elizabeth she exclaimed again taking her arm and drawing her rapidly forward let us pass them directly and i'll bet a guinea that before we have made five steps they will pass us why do you wish them to pass us martha said her companion with perfect simplicity miss o'donagough looked back thinking from these words that the governess must be within hearing but on the contrary perceiving that she had stopped to fasten emily's shoe she began laughing in a tone so loud that the young men both turned round to reconnoitre the moment their eyes fell upon the young ladies they stepped aside and permitted them to pass raising their hats at the same time in salutation miss hubert bowed and walked on well done you elizabeth said her companion strongly compressing her arm and tittering very audibly how beautiful they look don't they but they are only ensigns both of them i can tell you that i wish to goodness i knew their names do not speak so loud cousin martha or they will hear you said elizabeth innocently it is lord william southwood and mr templeton a lord cried the startled martha instantly turning round her head to look at them you don't say so and he bowing to us so politely don't you think we had better sit down upon that stone they must pass by it you see cause of the water coming in so isn't this capital fun miss hubert was by no means a stupid girl but she no more comprehended her cousin's exclamations than if they had been uttered in hebrew and replied very simply 
no don't sit there martha there is a much better place a little farther on where miss wilmot always lets us sit down and if you did like looking for shells you would find plenty there such as they are looking for shells exclaimed martha bursting into loud laughter oh my what a fool you are or is it only put on elizabeth that's it i see through it i'll be hanged if i don't you are a deep one with your bowings and knowing so well what their names are and all what do you mean cousin martha how can i help knowing the names of those two gentlemen if it is of them you are speaking replied miss hubert they both dined at our house yesterday gracious goodness is that true elizabeth dined at your house and one of them a lord will they come there again to-day i do not know replied elizabeth laughing in her turn but i am afraid not they do not come every day why didn't you speak to them you stupid girl if you know them so well demanded martha reproachfully i don't know them well replied her cousin i never see them except for a very little while after dinner in the drawing-room have they been there more than once inquired martha yes several times i think at least lord william has i don't remember seeing the other so often oh how i wish i do think it was very but both sentences warmly as they flowed from her heart were cut short ere completed by the prudent martha who at that moment recalled her mother's words concerning the importance of an intimate intercourse with the hubert family never did the admonition of a parent come more forcibly upon the heart of a child i must keep in with them if i die for it was the mental exclamation which followed the remembrance of this maternal warning and perceiving on once more turning round her head that the officers had changed the direction of their walk she again took the arm of her cousin who had quitted her side for a moment to examine a choice morsel of seaweed and began a direct and deliberate attack upon her affections by praising her eyes and the handkerchief that was tied round her neck hinting that she thought her mamma kept her a great deal too back and that her governess was already afraid of her concluding with an assurance that she never liked any girl so well before in all her life and that she hoped to her heart they should be very intimate and stick together like very near relations as they really were to all this elizabeth answered gently and civilly but reached home at last with a feeling of self-reproach for being so very tired of her cousin's company their tea-table awaited their return and notwithstanding the sublime speculations for the future which filled the heart and head of miss o'donagough the cherries and the cakes spread before her were sufficiently attractive to keep her tranquilly in the schoolroom till the ladies had left the dinner parlour now we will go upstairs and see your mamma shall we said miss hubert oh yes if you will i'm quite ready when i've done eating this one queen cake more and you really don't know if there's any officers or not dining here replied her cousin no indeed i do not was the unsatisfactory reply it is very probable that neither the aunt nor the niece were very sorry to have their tete-a-tete interrupted by the entrance of miss wilmot and the young ladies mrs o'donagough had already obtained all particulars respecting the present residence and manner of life of her dear brother-in-law mr willoughby and of the number of grandchildren bestowed upon him by his daughter nora had expressed the most heartfelt delight at hearing that she would be sure to see them all during the ensuing season in london and was by that time quite ready to scrutinize the countenance of her daughter in order to ascertain how the long day had answered great was the contentment which attended this examination of a countenance exceedingly capable of showing whether its owner were pleased or the contrary it was immediately evident to mrs o'donagough that her daughter was in one of her most amiable moods and though there had been no party at dinner and consequently but little opportunity of displaying the studied elegance of her own appearance still the style of everything about her darling agnes was such as to make her feel more sensibly than ever the immense importance of being united to her by the tenderest ties of affection it could not therefore fail of being very delightful to her to perceive that martha whom as she had told her husband she greatly feared she should find in the dumps was radiant in smiles and good humour and apparently on the best possible terms with that stupid shy-looking thing her cousin not only indeed had the dinner the servants and the plate of her beloved agnes excited all the warm affections of mrs o'donagough's heart but the observations she had made on her husband during the repast tended to convince her very forcibly that he too cautiously as he had hitherto expressed his feelings on the subject attached great importance to the connection 
never had she before seen him as he appeared to her on this important day quiet reserved respectful rather religious in his language but with amiable humility abstaining from giving too serious a tone to the conversation his wife gazed and listened with equal admiration and astonishment while he developed a degree of talent for which she even in her fondest days had never given him credit it shall not be my fault said she internally if he is not rewarded for all this cleverness he knows what he is about as well as most men and he shan't be stopped for want of a helping hand from me accordingly mrs o'donagough was enchanted beyond the power of language to express with her little great-niece emily declared elizabeth by far the loveliest creature she had ever seen and was obliged to pull out her pocket-handkerchief when speaking of their dear grandmother and the astonishing likeness which they both bore her mrs hubert listened to it all with great sweetness but suffered no great time to elapse between the coffee and the tea and hinted to miss wilmot that she did not wish emily to be kept up beyond her usual hour very soon after her departure mr o'donagough broke off his mild discussion with the general on the importance of enforcing a pure morality throughout the army and rising said i am afraid it is getting very late my dear you know my habits and must not suffer even the happiness of this blessed reunion to interfere with what we know to be our duty on this mrs o'donagough rose too with a look of meekness that really seemed quite angelic saying oh no not for the world and as if moved by the most perfect family sympathy martha slapped too the volume of engraving she was examining at the same moment so that the leave-taking was sudden and prompt and in less than two minutes after it began the allen o'donagough family found themselves enjoying the sea breeze on the broad flagstones of the marine parade thank god that's over cried mr allen o'donagough as soon as they had fairly cleared the premises i shall not be sorry to get home and have a draught of porter it has been so dreadfully hot all day observed his lady but to be sure nothing could be kinder or more flattering oh lor i am as tired as a dog exclaimed martha stretching out her arms and yawning vehemently but i don't care a straw i know what i know about the people that visit there and i'll be hanged if i don't care to be one of them you are your father's own child patty said mr o'donagough recovering his usual tone we shall make something of em between us well to be sure it is a pleasure to introduce you both to my relations and depend upon it you will never repent being civil to them said his wife with rather a mysterious nodding of the head made visible as they reached their own door by the light of the lamp that hung over it End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen a satisfactory disclosure and a judicious proposal a conjugal tete-a-tete -tete terminating in very amiable resolutions it is quite bedtime mamma is it not said elizabeth hubert as the door closed after the o'donagough family i am very very sleepy good night my dear replied her mother holding up her face to receive the farewell salute good night papa said elizabeth passing on to her father but before he accepted the kiss offered to him he detained her by the hand for a moment saying what makes you look so very weary to-night my dear girl have you walked more than usual to-day no papa we have walked very little to-day replied the young lady what is the matter then dearest you do not feel unwell i hope do you elizabeth stopped short in the middle of a yawn to laugh oh no papa pray do not send for the doctor i feel perfectly well only very sleepy perhaps you are tired of talking elizabeth you and your young cousin have had time for a great deal of conversation did she tell you much about new south wales demanded her father elizabeth shook her head and she replied no not a word what then did you talk about asked the general elizabeth again laughed and again shook her head is that shake of the head to be considered as oracular as that of my lord burleigh does it mean a very great deal said her father it means papa that i really and truly do not know what she talked about replied elizabeth that is to say you forget it i presume my dear that when the discourse was going on you knew of what subject or subjects it treated no indeed papa i did not was the quick reply 
my cousin said a great many things altogether i believe but i quite mean that i do not know what they were all about i did not always understand her did you find her upon the whole an agreeable companion elizabeth in reply to this direct inquiry miss hubert after hanging down her head a little and looking for a minute or two rather embarrassed replied no papa i did not and i do not think that my cousin martha found me an agreeable companion either nor do i believe that we shall ever be very great friends why so my dear said her father drawing her somewhat closer to him because she does not seem to know or care the least in the world about anything that i like and i do not know or care at all more concerning all she talks about well elizabeth replied her father this is unfortunate but perhaps not very extraordinary however you know we may be all very kind and obliging to her nevertheless oh certainly papa of course because she is a very near relation only perhaps as she is so very womanly mamma would invite her next time to dine with you and let emily and me come into the drawing-room before you come upstairs as usual and then for the rest of the evening and when we are all together i should not mind it at all mrs hubert who had changed her place while this conversation was going on and seated herself close behind her husband whose arm was thrown round his daughter could hardly repress a smile at this improved plan of operations but she did not permit it to be seen and said with much matter-of-fact gravity i believe you are right my dear and if her mamma makes no objection i certainly will do so accident education perhaps the climate in which she was born seem to have made this young cousin prematurely a woman and throwing you together as girls of the same age must i have no doubt be equally irksome to both we will not do so again elizabeth good night dearest miss hubert repaid this expression of maternal sympathy with a very tender kiss and bestowing one also on her father with rather more fondness than usual as if to show that she was exceedingly obliged by having encountered no opposition to the extraordinary measures she had been bold enough to recommend she left the room apparently in excellent spirits and without any external symptoms remaining of the extreme weariness of which she had complained miss wilmot is right exclaimed mrs hubert as soon as the door was closed there is evidently no danger of elizabeth's liking this terrible cousin too well why yes my dear replied the general i think you may be tolerably easy on that point and now agnes to speak without any jesting at all i trust that your spirits will recover their tranquillity and that you will cease to look every now and then as if you had just recollected some dreadful calamity that was hanging over you the cause my love is really not sufficient to justify the effect we are not the first people in the world depend upon it who have had a queer-looking set of cousins arrive from distant lands to claim kindred with them will you promise not to worry yourself about it any more yes montague i shall behave better now but i cannot tell you how i have dreaded the seeing my pure-minded ingenuous elizabeth falling into any tone of intimacy with my unfortunate young cousin and yet it seemed almost inevitable when two young things of equal age were thrown together but i did not do our girl justice dear creature i ought to have felt from the first that it was impossible i think so madonna replied general hubert rather reproachfully however i will forgive this misdoubting of the wisdom and good taste of fourteen if you will promise to support with perfect equanimity whatever effervescence may chance to arise from the superabundance of these good gifts of threescore and ten i confess to you agnes i rather dread the arrival of aunt betsy and so do i too replied his wife laughing but it is with a very different sort of dread from what i felt when in doubt as to the effect that might be produced by this new acquaintance on elizabeth and my dear kind-hearted father too he will be here in a fortnight and i perfectly well know what will happen at first he will feel that he cannot be too kind too cordial in his welcome to my aunt whereupon she will stun him with her eloquence smother him with her affection wear his spirits out by her incessant calls upon his admiration for her daughter till he grows nervous falls into a fit of the gout and instead of benefiting by the sea breezes we have promised him he will shut himself up in his room without saying a word about his sufferings to anybody but suffering martyrdom nevertheless yes that will be the progress exactly from benignity that desires the happiness of all the world to a gentle melancholy meekly resigning every hope of it for himself nevertheless i think that by keeping guard over him pretty watchfully i may be able perhaps to save him from a good deal of it but who can keep guard over aunt betsy who can prevent her seeing everything hearing everything comprehending everything and acting accordingly 
if she is very outrageous we must laugh at her replied agnes not but it will be hers to laugh at us first do you remember her prognostications and her prophecies montague when mrs o'donagough first renewed the intercourse with us will she not have some cause to triumph now no 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 dear not the least in the world replied the general there will be room enough in our little island depend upon it both for the o'donagough race and the huberts too and we must be very silly folks certainly if we cannot contrive to see as little of them as our own sense of propriety will permit us to do unquestionably it should be so returned agnes musingly and therefore we will trust that so it will be but do tell me montague what sort of conversation did that solemn-looking mr o'donagough entertain you with after we left the table he is a singular-looking man with an expression of countenance that seems to hover between natural audacity and affected sanctification yes replied the general it is a remarkably puzzling face and manner too i cannot make him out did he talk much no very little and i doubt if aunt betsy herself could have found much to object to in anything he uttered nevertheless i dislike him without being able exactly to explain why nay general hubert i think that riddle may be easily read replied agnes both in person and manner he is coarse and ungentlemanlike true yet that seems hardly sufficient to explain the feeling i have about him there was an evident air of restraint in every word he uttered yet it did not seem to proceed from what is usually called shyness either for his conversation such as it was consisted chiefly of questions concerning all our family connections and in a style of pertinacity too which shyness i think would gamble from your father in particular and frederick seemed to possess a strong hold upon his travelled memory i suppose that was because my father was so very civil and good-natured the night of the famous leave-taking in mrs peter's drawing-room replied mrs hubert yes certainly that may account for it as far as your father is concerned but of the two i think mr o'donagough's interests seem to be most keenly awake respecting everything of and concerning frederick stephenson and i do not remember that frederick did anything towards making an acquaintance with him on that memorable evening beyond reconnoitring him from a distant sofa through nora's eyeglass which was if you remember the mode by which at that time fred constantly assisted all defects real or imaginary in his visual organs oh i can see him now returned agnes laughing how well i remember his attitude as she naughty girl hid her laughing face behind him i am sure it is very good-natured in mr o'donagough if he saw all that and forgave it he appears perfectly to have forgiven it i assure you inquired with an air of great interest where frederick chiefly resided asked if he was as gay and lively as ever and if i mistake not begged to know how many children he had summing up the whole by assuring me that it would give him great pleasure to meet him again well certainly that does look like being in a very friendly and affectionate frame of mind replied mrs hubert and fortunately nora never hears their names mentioned without declaring that she wished for nothing so much as to meet my aunt barnaby again i therefore see nothing to stop the renewal of the acquaintance so auspiciously begun through nora's eyeglass by the way agnes resumed the general did not your aunt barnaby on that occasion introduce her bridegroom as the reverend mr o'donagough oh yes certainly she did and i presume he is the reverend mr o'donagough still is he not returned mrs hubert i do not feel quite competent to answer that question replied her husband he certainly did not tell me he was not yet somehow or other i doubt it i think from his appearance that it is most probable he went out as a missionary not of the church of england and if so it is as likely as not that on returning he left his frock behind him he said something about young men's first ardent impressions and opinions being liable to change and then muttered something about himself as being an example of this but i felt no inclination for the autobiography which i fancied was coming upon me and as he did not seem inclined to take wine i put a stop to it by joining you very skilfully managed said agnes and to say truth i have sufficient faith in your generalship mon général to prevent my having much fear about your individual annoyance but of all our difficulties the greatest is behind alas montague who is it must break to aunt betsy on her arrival the astounding fact that her niece martha is in europe in england in sussex in brighton 
perhaps in this very house who is it general hubert that will tell her this dearest agnes it can only be yourself replied the husband maliciously hubert have you the heart why no i rather think i have not he replied but do you not think the wisest way will be for us to go through the scene together if you insist upon my making the announcement tete-a-tete -tete, you will have it all to go through again afterwards true most true let us be together montague and pray my love resumed the general laughing do you think it will be necessary to surround yourself with the same sort of chevaux de frise when the event is made known to your father oh no not at all i am quite sure that everything which recalls the memory of my poor mother has a charm for him and then observe he has never seen my aunt barnaby as you did montague in the terrible days of her clifton brilliance still less if possible does he know anything of her various offences against aunt betsy so that to this moment he is perfectly free from any feeling of dislike towards her of any kind he must be aware i suppose that we have quizzed her letters a little but that's nothing and do you not think dearest montague that it will be but right and proper to leave him as much as possible in the same favourable state of mind towards her poor thing i fear she is not more likely to make friends now than formerly and her plea of being my own mother's sister does often come upon me with a painful conviction of its strength let it not be painful dear agnes replied her husband kindly you may be obliging and useful to her in many ways which need not interfere with our own comfort depend upon it the worst part of the reunion is over what elizabeth says of the young lady will infallibly prove true of the whole party they are not at all more likely to like us than we are to like them and i shrewdly suspect they are all three yawning at this moment with as much genuine weariness as ourselves so let us go to rest dearest without permitting our australian cousins to haunt us even in our dreams End of chapter thirteen